just hope my little phone stays connected. Well, hello, friends. We are live with you tonight at Ripley Presbyterian Church for our Bible study. Glad to have you that are joining with us. And I know we're getting on a few minutes early tonight. There may be a few people that are going to have to back up and hear this part. Uh, but do wanna, I do want to touch on just a couple of announcements. Um, if we didn't publicize well enough last week, I know some didn't get the message that we did not have our Bible study on online last week. We did a uh, fellowship event, and we're going to do that the fourth Wednesday of each month. Is that correct, Jen? The next one we know October for sure. Probably not in November, but uh, it it we'll may be... vary. the The time may vary, but it usually will have a holiday yeah. in the fall attached to it, like Thanksgiving or Christmas. Correct. So we'll be the fourth. Uh, for sure in October, we'll be off the fourth mm -hmm. week for Halloween trunk or treat. Y'all come join us if you can at the church. We'll do that as well. Um, but we're glad to be back with you again tonight. I'm going to bail out a little bit early, uh, but you are in good hands with these three wonderful panelists, and they've been gracious enough to let me go first tonight. Uh, we want to lift up any prayer concerns that we can share with our community that we need to be uh, mindful of this evening before we begin. I have a good report from my mom. Great. Uh, from her test, so we're, we're in good shape. Amen, amen. Thanks be to God. Um, good to, Joe, good to Joe Kowser, a friend of mine we were praying for who uh, you know, had a heart attack she uh, had one small blockage they've taken care of that put her on some medicine and sent her home so she's she's in good spirits and she's doing well as as well amen we love good. joe mm -hmm. good note yes good you. to hear good to hear all right dear friends let's pray together god we are so grateful for this gift of prayer this gift of study this time of worship counting our blessings and your goodness before us as we face all the trials of life, what a joy it is to know that we can journey with you and with one another by lifting each other up through our prayers, comfort, and love, and know that you are always with us. Even as we gather uh, by time and space and virtually, uh, your Holy Spirit continues to thrive and embrace us. Mold us more in your image, Jesus. We thank you for that gift. We pray for each of these that we mentioned here tonight and the names that go unspoken friends and family everyone on our prayer list anyone dealing with illnesses grief or loss struggle sinfulness as we all are broken needing daily to be made more in your image christ for we are your clay and you form us more like you when we trust in you so give us the illumination tonight help us to see more clearly your words of life and holy scripture and then inspire us to serve this world in your image and for your glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All righty. <clears throat> well, we're just about right here at six o'clock. We did our preliminaries and we're going to start here mm -hmm. tonight with a passage from Jeremiah. We've had Jeremiah for some time now, and uh, this is chapter 32. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it. I was going to give you some preface, but I'll do some of the background of Jeremiah. After I read this text, we'll read uh, Jeremiah 32. We're going to have the preamble, the first three verses of Jeremiah. Then we'll jump down to verse 6 and continue through verse 15. So listen with me for the word of the Lord. And that's the way Jeremiah starts. It. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of, king, of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle, Shalom, is going to come to you and say, buy my field that 
is at Anathoth, <clears throat> for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin, Hannah Mel, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, by the field that is in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours, buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed and sealed it, got witnesses and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neremiah, son of Mashiach, in the presence of my cousin, Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the courts of the guards. In their presence, I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. So Jeremiah, we've talked about some of the background of his writing. <clears throat> he is uh, sharing the story while Israel is in bondage. Many of the people have already been taken away, been taken away to Babylon. We're about the year 587 before Christ. And uh, Jeremiah, as we'll remember, he was a prophet. He was warning the people of Israel, as you turn from God, if you don't follow the Torah, follow the ways of the Lord, uh, there will be consequences. God's favor will not rest upon you, and you will be besieged by foreign lands. And that's certainly what came to fruition as the people of Israel were besieged by the army, as we heard, of Babylon. Many were already taken <clears throat> into captivity there. But now here, Jer Jeremiah, what we know is he was held back in the homeland. The war was still going on. So Judah was still fighting the waning days of the war. They knew they were going to lose ultimately, as um, or at least Jeremiah did. But he had been imprisoned by the king of Judah. So he's there on imprisoned by the king of Judah because he continued per, to prophesy against the people, against the leadership, holding them accountable, reminding them of the consequences, trying to bring them back to God. Uh, king of Judah didn't want to hear any more of it. So he put him in, you know, in prison. And Jeremiah had lived a life filled with adversity, y'all. Uh, he had paid people to try to take his life before He'd been uh, imprisoned and held in shackles by a priest. Um, family members had deserted him. I mean, he knew a life of turmoil as a prophet, a messenger of God. But what we find out tonight, what's exciting, not a, a true prophet, a true prophet like Jeremiah, not only are they a voice for God, but they also act. They put action to their faith. Y'all remember us talking about that, where we had a study not uh, well, several, probably a couple of months ago on James, where James said, you know, true faith is being faithful. We all kind of resonated with that word. True faithfulness, uh, head knowledge and heart knowledge is also hand knowledge, putting our actions to work, uh, put some teeth to our faith, some action. So here's what Jeremiah did. <clears throat> now, we'll unpack this story. He had this, I think it said a vision, or he heard it in a dream, the word of the Lord, to that his cousin was going to come to him and say, buy my land. And lo and behold, his cousin came, said the exact same thing. So he definitely knew this was a message from God. Now, <clears throat> what we're seeing here, though, we have to understand what's going on. Uh, the people of Israel were under attack. They didn't have their land, uh, you know, in a, in a way like the turmoil of the war going on in Russia and Ukraine. Much of that territory is unsettled right now. Whose is it going to be, right? So those people who are living on the border in your Ukraine, imagine if a relative were to come to them and say, now I've got this big old piece of land and I would love for you to buy it with a small fortune, 
may have even been a large for us, 17 shekels of silver. Will you buy this land because it's your right to purchase? Well, goodness gracious, who would do that? You know, when you buy that land, you don't even know if it's going to be yours, right? You don't know if you're going to modern day, you're Ukraine and Russia. Is Ukraine even going to have that land? Is Russia going to honor that? We know they're not going to if they take the territory. And that is the deal that Jeremiah was offered by his cousin Hananel. Now, why would he have done that, y'all? Why would he have made that purchase? Wow. He invested and he wanted everybody to know about it because really the answer comes in the very last verse of this passage. These beautiful words where Jeremiah says this, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Hmm. What a message and an action <clears throat> of hope Jeremiah gave to the people of Israel. What a true prophet. He was holding them accountable. He was calling them on the carpet. And, you know, wouldn't it have been tempting? I don't know about y'all. But when Babylon did come and besiege the land, wouldn't it have been tempting to say those famous words that we all love to say, I told you so. Right? Mm -hmm. That could have been Jeremiah's natural response. But instead, he became pastoral, even as a prophet. And he offered hope to those who were in bondage to say, look, you've turned from God. There are consequences. You're feeling this besiegement, but hold on people of faith. It will not last. There will be a common time when God's gonna restore us. When we return to him in prayerful obedience and surrender ourselves and our hopes and set aside our selfishness for serving one another in the greater kingdom of God, then there will be a restoration where once again, your property will have value. Not only am I gonna preach it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna purchase this land. Let's go even a little deeper though. And then I'll hush up with transition. Also, it wasn't just a, a gift of hope that Jeremiah did in buying the land, but it's very likely that Hananel, they were living in poverty. You know, they, they uh, anybody facing a war-torn state uh, they were probably struggling just to get by, just to survive, just to exist. So these resources that Jeremiah paid for this land actually bought, brought deliverance to his brothers and sisters in the faith, his blood family as well. So I'm grateful for this uh, story of Jeremiah, uh, the message that he does have that God is faithful, even when we fail to be faithful always as his children, we can always come back much like the prodigal son and be restored through God's grace, who not only welcomes us, but pursues us as the loving father. Amen. 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 Any questions <clears throat> or comments that y'all have to further expand on that Jeremiah text that mm -hmm. we had tonight? Um, you know, for... Cannot. A common yeah, go, Jen, please. I'm, I'm hoping, because like I said, I always like to be surprised. I never read those passages ahead of time. But I'm hoping that this, this idea of even in the midst of trouble, there's hope. That God's always there as a protection, as, as a stay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I have many song choices that go with that. But um, I, I, I like that theme. I mean, that's even even when we're in the midst of our trouble, the fact that we have a God to call on, the God who's with us through it all. Yeah. That's that's what I find very comforting. That's that's beautiful. And you know, <clears throat> doesn't it all isn't it amazing? These lectionaries were written, oh man, many, many years ago, and then they planned the seasons. And how often is it that the text for this week apply to what's going on in our life? As we hear the tension escalating between Russia and the United States in this dialogue and and I do want to speak to our young disciples who are part of my focus group because it is, I mean, it is fearful. Let's say that when you see the risk of war and the unknown, but Jennifer hit it spot on. May we never forget young disciples and older disciples alike, no matter what we face in this life, God is with us to sustain us. And ultimately, ultimately, the victory is ours through Christ our Lord. Thank y'all so much. 
All righty. I think we're transitioning now to, is it Miss Jen that's going next? Uh, no, I think it's Doc. Doc's going next. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Am I messing y'all's order all up? Okay. I'm going to stop my screen and uh, I'm going to listen here a little bit more. But Doc, take us away. Well, just a little comment on uh, the conflict between Russia and the United States. I happen to be a whole lot older than y'all. And I remember sitting in, in school when the intercom went off and uh, President Kennedy had been assassinated. And one of the things, I hope you can still hear me there. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that uh, took place was extreme fearfulness among all the young people that were listening to that. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen. We felt like uh, we would be attacked by the Russians. And we filled the churches up. And we spent an enormous amount of time on our knees in prayer. Everybody went, I think one of the highest attendance church Sundays ever in the history. And we prayed. And God saw us through a hard time. And I think if we pray now, God's going to see us through another hard time. Amen. We've got to turn back yeah. to God. Amen. I really Thank do. Think, you. I, I really believe that. That's, that was beautiful. Doc, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Have a blessed time with your family and friends tonight. The, the scripture that I have been asked to look at is one that's very, very familiar to all of us. It's, it's Luke 16, starting with the 19th verse. And these are, are, are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they have to do with the rich man and Lazarus. Now, the Lazarus is a term, is a, is a name that's used a good bit um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the New Testament. And Lazarus just uh, basically means um, Elazar, which means God has helped. So this is a situation where a name is used that just basically is a, is a catch-all name so that uh, we understand that God is helping this man Lazarus. So let's read what God has to say to us. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between you and us, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Speak God. God. <clears throat> so it's not that as you look at this, it's, it's not that the rich man did something bad to make the poor man's plight worse. It's that the rich man passed up an opportunity to help one less fortunate improve his stature in life. And when God does not sit in the throne in our lives, at least some of the time, we risk ignoring the needs of others. 
so the bottom line of this that we're going to work on tonight is that we must live out our faith in service and prayer. This week, we laid to rest a monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, who was a queen for my entire life. And she was really someone to be greatly, greatly admired. And Queen Elizabeth II, um, we listened to three documentaries the other night, Lan and I did, and I, I made a few little notes about her life because she just, the more I learned about her, the more special she became, that she actually drove an ambulance in World War II to take the injured to the hospitals as they were arriving back in England. Um, she never wavered. She was never polarizing. She never took sides. And she said that the way to be respected is to perform service for others. Now, we could just stop right then and there and say, that's it. But we'll, we'll say a little more. But that's the bottom line of what we're working on tonight. If you think about how blessed we are in this country, we'll kind of start with that thought. We'll kind of end with that thought. Uh, we are tremendously, tremendously blessed. We have possessions, even when we don't desire possessions, they come our way. Our, our country overall is just that, that wealthy. But our possessions are not owned by us. They're loaned to us. Um, there was, uh, Gandhi said one time that we didn't... Um, Let's see if I can remember this correctly. We didn't uh, uh, take the world the way it is uh, for our own use. We borrow the world today from our children. So whatever we do with our world today will be inherited by our children. We just are entrusted with it for a short period of time. So these possessions that are given to us are entrusted to us obviously so that we can meet our basic needs, but also so that we can help and even bless others. You look at, um, uh, Jennifer will like this, uh, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Yes. Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge says to the ghost of Jacob Marley, you're always a good man of business, Jacob. And the ghost exclaims, business, mankind was my business. The mm -hmm. common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. The disturbing part of this parable tells us to pay attention and wake up because we are so self-absorbed with ourselves that sometimes we fail to, to realize that sin can cave in in your own life and you don't even realize that you get so absorbed in your in your self that can you close in on yourself so much that we forget about charity we forget about helping others and it's only in charity and helping others that we find true joy so we are called to live lives of intentional faith live out our lives live out our faith intentionally to include actions in times in big ways but sometimes just in every little way, just the small things that we do, the kind things that we say, asking people about their family, when you find out they have a need, then try to help respond to help. So the common welfare of charity, mercy, and forbearance and benevolence, that's the business of a Christian. So you think about these five brothers, that uh, the rich man said, oh, you need to go back and tell my five brothers so that they don't fall into this trap. Well, in Dickens' story, Marley was uh, used to come back and shake his chains and, and use the ghost of Christmas past and present and future to get uh, Scrooge's attention. And basically what... Uh, Abraham is, is telling the rich man by virtue of Jesus's parable is we have told you 
what you need to be doing. So those five brothers represent us. We have been so blessed in this country, especially those of us like in Ripley Presbyterian Church. We have been raised in, in, in church and around church, and we know what we're supposed to do. We've been given way more opportunities than so many people throughout the world uh, have been given. But rather, we still have to be careful and we'll fall in the trap of ignoring the needs of others and taking complete care of ourselves and being selfish with what we have. So growing up, our parents and our teachers may have reminded us that our actions have consequences. But the gospel today reminds us, and I think this is important, that our inactions have consequences as well. There's more to just being good than not being bad. We can sin by what we do, but we can also sin by what we fail to do. When God sends opportunities our way, we need to respond to them. Um, Mother Teresa really was a, an amazingly poor person that was maybe one of the richest people that ever lived. Remarked that you can find Calcutta all over the world if you have eyes to see and to look. So we too can find people like Lazarus all over the world, all over Ripley, all over everywhere, if we will just open our eyes and look and we can see. But there are also those that are suffering not only from physical needs, but there are many that are suffering from spiritual needs. So in order, when, when Lynn and I years ago went to, uh, to Honduras on a little mission trip, the uh, people there reminded us that we couldn't go in and tell the people about Jesus when they were hungry and cold and sick, that you had to feed them and you had to clothe them and you had to get them well before they knew that you cared enough about them to listen to you about Jesus. So when we look at Matthew 25, we're supposed to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, to visit the sick and the imprisoned, to close the naked and to welcome the stranger. Uh, the spiritual works of mercy are to counsel those that are doubtful, comfort those that are afflicted, and instruct the ignorant to admonish sinners, to bear wrongs patiently and forgive offenses willingly and to pray for the living. May we have the eyes to see Lazarus, the hearts to love him, and the arms to serve using that with which we have been blessed. So as we look, um, Matthew links eternal life and punishment with how we treat the hungry and the thirsty, the strangers, the naked and the sick, and those in prison. That's Matthew 25. And the reversal after death is ultimate. Um, once we die, um, we can't go back and undo what we have done or especially undo what we have not done. So Luke makes it very, very clear that Jesus's ministry is focusing on the poor. He declares that he's been anointed by the spirit of the Lord to bring good news to the poor. And Jesus admonishes his followers not to just invite friends and neighbors to their parties, the rich, but to extend the invitation to the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. So this invitation needs to be extended by us to those that don't have. When you think about how blessed we are in North America, the story of the rich man and Lazarus uh, are difficult because our lifestyles stand in such sharp contrast to what we're reading here in the Bible that a majority of the people in the world live on so much less than we do that uh, we have trouble seeing uh, what Jesus is trying to tell us here. So we have to look a little bit harder. But like so much else that Luke says about money and possessions, 
it's a very, it's an indictment not only of the great confidence that we place in our own financial security, but of the drastic inequities between the rich and the poor that are perpetuated. So in this story, God's eternal judgment has everything to do with how we use wealth in this life and whether we attend to those less fortunate in our midst. Our temptation, this is a Catholic friar that said this, our temptation is to explain away a story like this and to remove its blatant depiction of how God will ultimately vindicate the cause of the poor. But this message is clearly stated. Like the rich man's five brothers, We've been given all the warning we need. We need to help others do like what Queen Elizabeth said. In order um, to be respected, you have to perform service for others. Okay, thank you. So good. Great. So, so very good. Oh, man. And now I've got um, <laughs> I have the psalm. Uh, I have Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6, and then 14 through 16. And this is the NIV. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Speak to God. Oh, yeah. This, um, in looking at the background of this, and my sister, when I told her which, she said, which, which scripture is yours? And I told her this one. She said, oh, that's one of my favorites. Um, but I looked up a little background on it. And some people, some experts think that maybe Moses could be the author of this one because they attribute Psalm 90 to Moses. But then others say, you know, it could be a Psalm of David or maybe even a third person. So, so no one's really sure. But honestly, the beauty of it and the message of it doesn't really matter who it comes from because I think it's for all of us. Um, and so at the very beginning of this, you know, in the first two verses, we refer to God by four different names. He is the Most High, the Almighty, the Lord and my God, you know, four different references to the, the power and the majesty of God and, and kind of uh, going with what Doc said about Queen Elizabeth, one of the, the little quotes or memes that I saw about her uh, this week that resonated with me was that when she was asked about her faith, she hoped that, that Jesus would return in her lifetime. And mm -hmm. when asked why, she said, because I want to bow before him and lay my crown at his feet. And, and I thought, you know, what what faith what what a great message there um with this particular psalm we have a lot of um protection images connected with god uh and one of the things that that i think just being honest here i think a lot of times we maybe come to god when we've got a problem or when we need his help instead of residing with God all the time, which is what I th think the suggestion behind this psalm is. Let's, let's live with God. Let's dwell with God. Um, in the, the third and the fourth verse, uh, you see a lot of the, the pronoun you, and you see a lot of bird imagery. You know, surely he will save you. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings, you will find refuge. He will be your shield. And, and that is just English teacher here, that is making it seem like it is for us personally as an individual. It's not God's going to save y'all. It's not a collective. It's more that this is a promise for every single person. It's not just if you're a part of this group or that group or anything else. It's, it's a promise for all, for every single person. 
Now, the fowler snare, fowler, of course, uh, in poetry that I read a lot of times, the fowler, of course, is the hunter, the, the snare, the trap. Uh, and a fowler can, uh, can change traps and methods. Uh, they can entice people maybe with uh, pleasure or profit as a lure uh, to try to get people to come through. Um, but God's going to save you from all that. Uh, and just like a mother hen, he's going he's gonna to cover you with his feathers uh, and you find refuge, you find safety uh, there. You know, it's, it's, um, it's like sh he shelters you under his wings. I believe there's a song we sing that has that phrase in it. And it says he will also save you from pestilence. And when I think of pestilence, I think of like problems and sickness. And I know, uh, I think my sister mentioned that she read this a lot, like at the outbreak of COVID, this was something that gave her great comfort. Um, and I do know and understand that pestilence doesn't mean if he's going to save us from that, that we would never be sick or never suffer in our lives, but that God will be with us through that entire journey. Uh, and I read a story about this guy. His name was Lord Craven. I looked for his first name and couldn't find it. Uh, he was a Christian, lived in London uh, in the 15th century, which would have been uh, right in the middle of the bubonic plague. And when uh, the bubonic plague had really reached its height in London, Lord Craven decided he needed to get out of town. He packed his bags, he had his coach ready. And then as he was getting ready literally to, to go downstairs to get into his carriage, he heard one of his servants say, well, I guess since Lord Craven is leaving, uh, you know, he thinks that, you know, to avoid the plague that he thinks that his God lives in the country and doesn't live in the city. Mm. And Lord Craven actually heard that comment from his servant and it, it struck him and he canceled his trip. And, and he, he, he believed this. He said, my God lives everywhere and he can save me and help me and uplift me in a town just as much as he can in the country. And so he decided I'm gonna stay where I am. And he actually became someone who tried to help people who were suffering with the plague. So he stayed among the vic victims and he worked among them and never in this plague that killed one third of the population of Europe at that time, did he ever catch the disease himself, which was so highly contagious. Um, so I thought that was, was pretty amazing. Uh, you also see in here that God's faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Uh, shield, of course, we know rampart, sometimes you hear buckler or armor. Uh, and it's almost like God's, it's like double protection for us. It's like, you know, he's, he's really insulating us uh, from harm if possible. And then also the next part, he actually shifts gears. It says, you will not fear the terror of the night or the arrows by day or the pestilence in the darkness or the plague in the, main, in the, in the midday. So if you do have this faith in God and this confidence that he's going to take care of you and, and you live in that, then you realize nothing is out of God's control. He's going to take care of us no matter what. And it, it kind of resonates with the idea of the, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And I've, I've Lynn, I've heard your daddy quote that so many times to recite it. And every time I, I say that, I hear it in his voice now. Um, but it's, it's just so, um, such a, a moving thing. And this faith, you know, I think, Doc, you said it a few weeks ago, faith is having confidence in what you believe. It's, it's believing it, it's accepting it, and it's living it. Uh, I loved what Jody said. It's, it's head knowledge, it's heart knowledge, and it's hand knowledge. <laughs> um, in this last part, because he loves me, says the Lord, we switch speakers. We switch uh, the speaker of our psalm. Instead of talking to God, this is God talking to us now and says, he says, because he loves me, which in one translation I read, because he sets his love upon me, I will do all these things for him. And so to me, that is because we choose to love God, because we choose to accept God, 
He's going to do all these things. And literally, I counted up. There's eight promises that he makes to us. He says, I will rescue him. I will deliver him. I will protect him and set him in a high place. I will answer him, respond to him when he speaks to me. I'll be with him in trouble in times of distress. I'll deliver him. I'll bring him to safety. I'll honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him to make sure he has abundance in his journey. And I will show him my salvation. I will let him see the victory. I will let him be delivered. And some of the ways that I think we can show God this, that we do set our hearts and our love with God. How do we show God that we love him? Of course, we worship. We spend time with God. We listen. We study. We do what we're doing right now. We study his word. We speak to God. We pray. We think of God even in the moments when we don't need him to do something for us. Um, we adore God. We love him. We, we speak about God to other people. And we give to God and make glad sacrifices to God and for God. I think that's the hand knowledge there. You know, we, we put feet on our faith and we do what we can do. Um, you know, I love a good song and Psalms kind of lends itself to the songs. So, of course, several um, biblical, just a few, few little lyrics here. Oh, God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. You know, the fact that we have an eternal home residing with the father and that he keeps us um, close to his heart. This one, uh, you know, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. I've always sung that. I've never really looked up. What is a bulwark? So I did. It's a defensive wall. He puts a wall up to protect us. And then, um, one of, one of the beautiful songs, we don't sing it very often, but it says there is a place of quiet rest, a place where sin cannot molest, a place of comfort sweet, where we our Savior meet, a place of full release, a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. And then one that is not religious, but I think also has a really good message uh, from the immortal Pixar original Toy Story. <laughs> Uh, think about God in this way. You got a friend in me. <laughs> when the road looks rough ahead and you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed, just remember what your old pal said. You got a friend in me. You got troubles? I got them too. But there isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. We stick together. We see it through because you got a friend in me. And as the years go by, our friendship will never die. You're going to see it's our destiny because you got a friend in me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it with that. Mm. Awesome. <laughs> that is one boy, Thank Jen. You. That's, that I is love the songs. Good. I know. And, it, and, you know, I'm so glad that you incorporate them because a lot of times when we're singing them or I'm playing them or you just don't realize that that's a that's poetry that's a message it is and sometimes really when, it, when it hits you when you're singing it sometimes you almost can't sing it all the way through exactly I, that has happened to me before exactly that was, that was wonderful okay i guess it's my go um clean up i'm back clean up okay my selection is first timothy chapter 6 verses 6 through 19 and I'll continue on this uh, theme. And um, I'm reading from the message tonight. Okay. A devout life does bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless and we'll leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. But if it's only money these leaders are after, they'll self-destruct in no time. Lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after. <clears throat> but you, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all of this. Pursue a righteous life, 
a life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, courtesy. Run hard and fast in the faith. Seize the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ, who took his stand before Pontius Pilate and didn't give an inch. Keep this command to the letter and don't slack off. Our master Jesus Christ is on his way. He'll show up right on time. His arrival guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler, high king, high God. He's the only one death can't touch. His light's so bright that no one can even get close. He's never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't take him in. Honor to him and eternal rule. Oh, yes. Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever manage, to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So I got there's there were just so many points in in this um, that you could come to, but I'm gonna keep going along the um, the point of hope and and spreading hope. Um, Paul kind of recommends the virtue of simplicity. He he employs that often repeated proverb: "We brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it." And um, and he says it's a secondary virtue that first relies on the faithfulness of God to provide what is needed. And he's basically saying if you've got a roof on your roof over your head and shoes on your feet and food to eat, you're good. But you know, be content with that. And he said, trust, we've got to trust in God's faithfulness to be the secure foundation for our lives. Paul's case is strengthened by warnings about the negative consequences of loving money and possessions. Now, he didn't say that money was the root of all evil. He said the, it's the love of money that is a root of all evil. Loving money, putting wealth and riches, loving that before you love God and love your neighbor. He says, those that love money, those having a disordered relationship with money. And I like that phrase, a disordered relationship with money. And then to me, that smacks of obsession with money. There's never enough. People who are obsessed with that, there's never enough, never enough. Um, they, they said they risk serious harm and he's worried about them. He says they use terms like pierced with pains and ruin and destruction to describe their fate that they're headed toward to. Their love of money is a form of idolatry, an inordinate attachment to those things that are not worthy of love and cannot love us back. A pocket full of gold cannot love you back, as Vince Gill would tell you. Because <laughs> he wrote a really great song about it. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it says the things that we love form us most deeply. The things that we love form us most deeply. Um, God doesn't want us to love money. He wants us to love our neighbor. He wants us to love him. That's what forms us. Now, he, say, he didn't say money is a bad thing. Wealth is not a bad thing if it's used correctly if it's used to better the lives of those that don't have as much. And he's telling, he's charging Timothy. He's talking to Timothy because he's kind of at the end of his life and he knows Timothy's fixing to take up, you know, this job. And he's telling, it's the pastoral letter. He's telling Timothy, you're going to have to look out for this and you're going to have to go tell folks that have gotten so obsessed with money and possessions that they think that buys them higher up in the church and they should have more power in the church and they should be more recognized in the church. And he said, and Timothy, you've got to be careful now. Don't get caught up in that. He said, because that's not what it's about. 
that that doesn't that buys you nothing in the church. That's not what the church is about. And um, okay, getting back to that, it says when we look at Paul letters it seems clear that he's concerned about the risk not only for the individuals but especially for the impact on the body of christ the church he said christian life is to be lived corporately and a, as a unified and harmonious body knitted together in mutual service as was the pattern of christ we are to put our faith in god who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light it says, it asserts the ultimate power of God as manifested in the self-giving servant, Jesus. He was self-giving. It wasn't about him. It was what he could do for others. Paul suggests that the church should not embrace a theology of scarcity. Instead, it should model a theology of generosity. A model of generosity. That's what he wants us to have in our hearts. Um, to if we are blessed with wealth or riches, he wants us to be generous and use it in the right way, not to become obsessed. Be thankful and use it in the right way. Um, let's say, okay, it says this means engaging in practices such as simplicity, welcoming the stranger in charity and justice on behalf of the least in our midst. For Christians, the practice of living as a church and community is not a mere coincidental gathering of like-minded individuals. It demands rhythms of mutual love, support, and prayer so that even the least of these find their place in God's community of redemption. It calls on us to knit together and to work together and love those that have not, do for those that have not, and, um, and finding that joy of doing that. I've always thought, and I can't remember who told me this, if it was my mama or my daddy, that said, when you get to feeling sorry for yourself, you need to go do something for somebody. And then they don't need to know you did. Mm. <laughs> mm. And, I always, and you know, that is the truth. That is mm. the truth. And it's, it, it is, it does give you more joy to be able to do it for them. And they never know that you did it, you know, to, to share some of yourself with others that's the best best way in the world to start feeling better so he tells timothy fight the good fight of faith and to fight the good faith fight of faith boy that's a lot of alliteration there jim you love that okay let me try it again fighting the good fight of faith that's it calls for practices of self-study we've got to look inwards contemplation confession loving accountability and forgiveness and so in order for us to be generous, to have generosity, we've got to be good with ourselves. We can't just do it to make ourselves feel better, you know, but it does work. But we've got to do it from the heart. We can't do it from show. We can't do it to toot our own horn. We've got to do it because we know it's the right thing to do. And golly, we're just going to get blessed by it. We don't do it to get blessed by it, but. We sure like that blessing. We sure like that joy because guess what? When it feels that good, you just want to go do it again. You just want to keep on doing that. Keep on sowing those seeds of kindness every morning. So, and um, I came across this message and I had read it before and it really resonated with me. And it was, it said, um, if you can read this message, it says, had a long, hard day. Here's some perspective. If you have food in your fridge, clothes on your back, a roof over your head and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world. If you have money in the bank, your wallet and some spare change, you are among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than the million people who will not survive this week. If you have never experienced the danger of battle, the agony of imprisonment or torture, or the horrible pangs of starvation, you are luckier than 500 million people alive and suffering. And if you can read this message, you are more fortunate than 3 billion people in the world who cannot read it at all. And so that's something just to remember when you wake up every day, 
and remember, isn't it wonderful to be able to wake up and have all these opportunities to share God's love and to be generous and to use your talents and blessings and wealth and get out there and just do the best you can as a human being. And um, it said one last thing. God provides every blessing in order that we might share from them. Share. We get that. We get taught that from before you can even remember, you know, learning how to share. Seed for sowing and bread for food arises from the one who scatters broadly. That's a good one. To be enriched in generosity is to be able to generously enrich. And I really like that one. Mm -hmm. To be enriched in generosity is to be able to generously enrich. Think of all the good things that you can do with that. And all of this is gain and godliness and contentment like Paul describes. If we're seeking that contentment, that is the way to it. So to me, it's, all this, all this does is point to the generous giving life that is the result of the gospel, the result of what God and Christ Jesus has done for us. He's lived it. He's, he's <clears throat> shown us what to do. His life was all about that. And the resulting action which the gospel engenders. And the good confession becomes the rallying cry for the good fight of the faith to which Timothy and all of God's people are called. And that's what, all I have tonight. And it just sort of piggybacked off what Jody said and what Doc said and what Jennifer said. God is with us. He is for us and he will protect us. And it is our job to get out there and spread that message in action and in deed. And well, these awesome. were really linked tonight. That was really great. They were really linked. You had a lot of pearls, but I, I don't know whether to give it to Hollis or Ann. But when you feel sorry for yourself, go do something for somebody else and don't tell them who did it. I really like that. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Lynn, why don't you read that last one that you did? as the closing prayer and put amen at the end of it. Cause I think that's great. If you don't mind. Oh yeah. Oh, that last one. Yeah. I think it was the last one that you did. <laughs> okay. Or just, if you don't care, will you, will you pray us out? I actually have a prayer okay. uh, that I've been saving. Um, it was uh it's a prayer by Robert Louis Stevenson, mm. and it was provided to me by my very good friend, Tommy Covington. So I'd like to pray that prayer tonight to close us out. Dear God, purge out of every heart the lurking grudge. Give us the grace and strength to forbear and to persevere. Give us the grace to accept and to forgive offenders. Forgetful ourselves, Help us to bear cheerfully the forgetfulness of others. Give us courage and gaiety and the quiet mind. Spare to us our friends. Soften to us our enemies. Bless us, if it may be, in all our innocent endeavors. If it may not, give us the strength to encounter that which is to come. That we be brave in peril, constant in tribulation, temperate in wrath, and in all changes of fortune and down to the gates of death, loyal and loving one to another. Amen. Amen. Hey, Mr. Tommy, I need a prayer now. <laughs> Everybody out there have a wonderful evening. Right. Thanks. That was great, y'all. Good you. night, everyone. <laughs> Love y'all. Jody will close this out eventually. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> You'll be all right. Yeah. Bye. Love y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.